Good morning. I'm Amanda Agosti, the Executive Director of the City Club of Chicago. I want to thank the over 750 people that have signed up to watch President Preckwinkle's remarks this morning. Since 1903, the City Club has remained committed to providing a forum for civic and public affair discussions for the city, the county, and the state. Now more than ever, we remain committed to that, and thank you all for your support, and especially for Madam President's support during this unprecedented time. On behalf of the Board of Governors and the nearly 2,000 City Club members, I'd like to welcome President Tony Prockwinkle for the City Club's first virtual event. Thank you. Good morning. This is a challenging moment in history as we confront the COVID-19 pandemic together. As many have said, this time is not unprecedented. I'm a former history teacher, and when I read the news coming from Wuhan, China, I purchased a book on the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. It was a sober warning of what was to come. I wanted to understand how the world responded to that crisis, what we could do to prepare, and what we could do differently to improve upon that response. I feared that the public health crisis would rapidly become an economic crisis. I knew that this virus would require the kind of government response we saw during the Great Depression. And we're seeing this play out on every level today. Our local governments are acting more quickly than ever before. Sweeping stimulus legislation is moving through Congress. I've spent some of my evenings thinking about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt and the New Deal. These were big ideas and big plans with an even bigger impact. But big ideas are not enough. We have a moral obligation to focus on equity as well. Our recovery from this pandemic must include everyone. It must include those communities that have been impacted the most. It must include our Black and Latinx communities. Because we've already seen that with COVID-19, as is true of every other crisis, our black and brown communities are hit the hardest. As was true in the 1918 pandemic, the number of infections is staggering. And the unemployment rate is the highest it's been since the Great Depression. The Chicago heat wave of 1995 and the 2008 recession with the subsequent mortgage crisis are also more recent lessons to draw from. In July of 1995, a brutal heat wave killed more than 700 people in Chicago. And most of those deaths were African Americans. They lived in communities already devastated by structural racism, redlining, lack of access to health care, lack of healthy food, and over policing. The government was not prepared to respond to that crisis with an equity lens. In 1995, no one addressed the root causes of inequity that led to those preventable deaths. We saw something very similar in 2008, the mortgage crisis and the Great Recession, what many naively called a once-in-a-generation event that devastated communities of color throughout the nation. Here in Cook County, black families that had spent generations amassing enough wealth to finally own their own homes saw that wealth wiped out in a matter of months. Their homes were foreclosed upon by predatory lenders and their home equity vanished. Since then, black home ownership has fallen to the rates we saw in the 1940s. 
They still have not recovered. At Cook County, however, under my administration, we've worked to mitigate these disastrous events with an equity lens. We launched the Cook County Land Bank Authority, which works with community developers to rehab homes and sell them to homeowners at affordable prices to bring the dream of home ownership back to these devastated communities. We launched the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership to help residents find jobs that pay a living wage with career pathways and certifications. We helped homeowners fight foreclosures to give them a chance to save their family homes. More recently, in 2019, we launched the Southland Development Authority to catalyze growth and investment in the South suburbs because this part of the county has not recovered from the 2008 recession. The difference between 1918, 1929, 1995, 2008, and today is we will not allow government to naively assume everyone will be hit equally hard by this pandemic. Today, we know that we need to use an equity lens to distribute resources according to need, acknowledge the history of structural racism that led to these health and economic inequities, and listen to what impacted communities really need from us. We also know that we cannot do this alone. We must partner with other units of government. And I want to acknowledge Mayor Lightfoot for her leadership during this pandemic. We must partner with philanthropic entities, community-based organizations, and private sector companies. We can only get through this with strong partnerships and collaboration at every level. If we don't help our elderly and immune-compromised neighbors get groceries and other essentials, they might not survive. If we don't check on our friends, our parents, our coworkers, our congregants, they too might not survive. It's not just our academic moral obligation to care for others, it's a matter of life or death. During this time of physical distancing and virtual interaction, many of us feel more alone than ever. But know that you are not alone. We are not alone. And Cook County is here to help. That's why I'm proud to release our plan to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic together. Today we've established the Cook County COVID-19 response plan from rapid response to equitable recovery. This plan affirms our commitments, our priorities, and our actions in response to the pandemic, both now and over the next two years. Our response plan details the actions we've taken since January to respond to the impending crisis. Despite federal inaction, we began preparation in earnest. Cook County Health and the Cook County Department of Public Health prepared for surges in patients, engaged with community partners to implement public health guidelines, tested Cook County Health patients and staff, conducted extensive contact tracing, and established a multilingual hotline and email for resident questions and concerns. Since January, Cook County Health has tested and treated thousands of patients and staff, including patients without the ability to pay, and staff and detainees at the Cook County Jail. Cook County Health restructured the emergency room at Provident Hospital to enable physical distancing. They moved services to telehealth to keep patients safe while still serving nearly 1,000 patients at the hospital during the ER closure. We deployed additional staff to Stroger Hospital and Cermak Health, the treatment unit at the jail. And as always, as always, Cook County Health has honored our mission to serve those in need, regardless of ability to pay. The Cook County Department of Emergency Management and Regional Security activated the Emergency Operations Center on March 3rd. They began immediately coordinating with hospitals, municipalities, and first responders throughout Cook County to provide extensive support. 
They've distributed more than 2 million pieces of personal protective equipment to first responders, senior living facilities, and municipalities. EMRS has worked closely with the Cook County Department of Public Health to launch an alternative housing program for those who did not need hospitalization but could not safely self-isolate at home. EMRS has also worked closely with the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office to open a surge center and several mobile storage units to ensure that all who succumbed from COVID-19 were treated with the utmost dignity and respect and that their families could have sufficient time to make funeral arrangements. To repeat the words of our Cook County Medical Examiner, we treat those who come through our doors as if they are our loved ones. The Cook County Justice Advisory Council coordinated efforts to safely release more than 27% of the Cook County jail population between February and May of 2020. Jails are petri dishes, and our public health experts told us that the detainees could not safely practice social distancing unless the population could be significantly reduced, putting both staff and detainees in grave danger. Today, the jail population has reached a new record low of just over 4,000 detainees, down from almost 11,000 in 2013. We could never have achieved this if we hadn't worked diligently with our partners through the MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge to carefully and sustainably reduce the jail population over the past several years. We rapidly reduced the jail population by providing extra health and housing supports to all those who were released to ensure that there was no negative impact on community safety. Not a single person was turned away who needed housing. We could not have achieved this without the valiant and dedicated work of Treatment Alternatives for Safer Communities, TASC, Henry Sober Living, New Beginnings, and Claudia and Eddie's Place. I want to thank these partners. The Bureau of Technology, or BOT as we call it, provided extra te telecommunications infrastructure at Cook County Jail so detainees could conduct visit video visitations after physical distancing policies were enacted. BOT also provided assistance to enable our Cook County emergency court hearings and helped offices under the president to safely work from home on a very large scale while still providing vital services online. We were able to keep our employees and residents we serve safe through this measure. The Bureau of Economic Development rolled out the Community Recovery Initiative, providing an expansive and language accessible technical assistance network to small businesses, not-for-profits, and independent contractors. Economic Development also created a new loan fund as part of this initiative to provide zero interest, rapid loans of up to $20,000 to very small businesses and independent contractors. This technical assistance network was provided in partnership with American Business Immigration Coalition, the Illinois Restaurant Association, and the National Partnership for New Americans. The Bureau was able to help 179 businesses access more than $3 million from the Paycheck Protection Program. I also want to thank these important partners for their good work. The Bureau of Finance deferred $45 million worth of taxes, fines, and fees for April, May, and June to provide financial relief to businesses and residents. These are just a few of the major initiatives I wanted to share regarding Cook County's rapid response to the pandemic. Cook County staff members have been working hard over the past several months to help residents and businesses. They work long hours and weekends, many while caring for children and families. Staff members such as Dan Ryan. Dan is an operating engineer at our Lighton Courthouse. He has two young daughters with severe heart conditions who are at high risk. 
He quarantined from his children as he was in contact with an individual who tested positive for COVID. Other than a few days he took off to ensure that he was not positive and going to get tested and retested, Mr. Ryan continues to come to work every day. For their safety, he continues to keep his distance from his six-year-old and eight-year-old daughters, forgoing hugs and tender moments that make him a doting father. There's also William Cantrell, one of the best custodians we have in the county. Mr. Cantrell real routinely offers to help finish other employees' sections while someone takes the day off. This includes ensuring that the Markham Courthouse is not just clean, but also sanitized. I'm grateful for our essential employees, such as Mr. Ryan and Mr. Cantrell, and all of our Cook County employees who have gone above and beyond to help in this crisis. When we think back to 1995 or 2008, what makes our approach today so unique is that each and every agency I have mentioned has used an equitable approach. We prioritize personal protective equipment requests according to need. We prioritize language accessibility. There are sign language interpreters at all of our press conferences. And I'd like to thank today Amanda Graziano. Did I say it right? Close. <laughs> Grazian, I think. And Walter Matthews. Thank you very much. The public health hotline is multilingual. Alert Cook is a texting service to reach those who might not have computers but who need to hear updates from us. We surveyed our community partners and advocates to hear their needs. We made sure that our community recovery initiative was open to all, regardless of immigration status, because we're a welcoming county. We prioritized very small businesses and independent contractors with the community recovery initiative. We knew those businesses and gig workers were predominantly minorities, and especially women of color, and that we needed to protect the most vulnerable. Cook County is taking an equitable approach to our long-term recovery efforts, and we've adopted a new set of principles to guide our work. This work will align with the work already underway through the policy roadmap, the five-year strategic plan for offices under the president. Given the exceptional circumstances in this emergency, we commit to initiatives that provide support in areas where Cook County has the authority and resources to have the greatest impact, prioritize support for Cook County's most vulnerable populations by using a racial equity lens, maintain continuity of essential public services for residents and businesses throughout Cook County, coordinate efforts with other units of government to strategically leverage shared resources, focus on suburban Cook County, which has substantial needs but limited resources. Our core values, equity, excellence, and engagement are centered throughout the equitable recovery phase of this plan. The plan can be accessed at our website, but I would also like to discuss three initiatives today. These initiatives address the root causes of inequity, including our community partners and residents, and ensure that when Cook County recovers from this crisis, we will recover together. Our recovery will encompass everyone, not just those who have the access to the most resources. I spoke about digital equity at my last City Cub speech at Maggiano's in September. That seems like a very long time ago now. And Maggiano's, like every restaurant in Illinois, is closed for dine-in business. I'm grateful that City Club allowed me to virtually reopen their civic engagement platform with this address and I look forward to sharing a comfortable plate of Italian food with you when Maggiano's can safely reopen. But this live stream, like many things today, is only accessible to you if you have access to high-speed internet. And it's estimated that one quarter, one quarter of our Cook County residents lack high-speed internet. And those rates are much higher 
for people of color. While digital equity mattered before, it matters even more now. Students are languishing at home, unable to complete their homework without laptops, and missing Zoom classes because they don't have high bandwidth. Families struggle to apply for unemployment relief because they can't fill out the applications on their phone. We cannot allow one quarter of Cook County to fall further behind as we recover digitally through the next phase of this crisis. That's why we're formally announcing the work of CODE, the Council on Digital Equity. This Cook County initiative has been charged with overseeing our efforts to advance digital equity. As part of our work, to advance digital equity, we are also proud to launch a new open learning platform with the University of Chicago Office of Civic Engagement. Soon we will launch a website for all Cook County residents with six weeks of engaging lectures. This content will be curated by the University of Chicago's Office of C Civic Engagement and made available and accessible on a new website. As a University of Chicago alum, I'm excited about this new educational engagement opportunity for our residents. We're calling the learning platform Cook County Presents, open lectures for residents in partnership with the University of Chicago Office of Civic Engagement. I plan to watch more than a few of the lectures myself, especially the American history related ones. The second initiative I would like to share is our fair transit demonstration project. While the stay-at-home order has caused transit ridership to fall dramatically, many essential workers have still have to ride public transit to get to their jobs. Our grocery store workers, pharmacy assistants, nurses, and line cooks need affordable, accessible transit now more than ever. That's why we're moving forward with the Fair Transit Demonstration Project. The Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways continues to work with our regional transit partners, PACE, Metro, and CTA, during this challenging time. We're advancing this comprehensive initiative to bring affordable, accessible transit to more riders on the south side of Chicago and in the south and southwest suburbs. Many of these riders are workers who have been historically undervalued, until now, that is. And the last initiative I'm excited to announce is our new Community Advisory Council. As we've responded to COVID-19, the breakdown in commu communication, especially on digital platforms, has been highlighted. Yet engagement between communities and government has never been more urgent. That's why we're launching a Community Advisory Council. The council will be composed of community leaders and advocates. They will evaluate our efforts according to the COVID-19 response plan, provide feedback from their communities on its effectiveness, existing gaps in services, and explore potential areas for partnership. The council will also serve as an important conduit back to their communities to let residents know what Cook County is doing and what resources we can provide. We also have feedback, a feedback form on our website and would love to hear your thoughts on how we can partner how we can improve, and how we can add to the plan. I encourage you to participate in this plan because we cannot bring full recovery to Cook County without you. COVID-19 has shown us that not all heroes wear capes. But make no mistake, they are all around us. We must play a role in recovery alongside these everyday heroes our delivery drivers, our postal workers, our transit workers, our grocery store clerks, and volunteers at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. The depository is a longtime partner, and I want to especially thank them. And of course, our healthcare workers, like my daughter, a dialysis nurse who was on the front lines of this crisis putting the lives of others before her own. I worry about her and thank her for her service during this pandemic. And there are so many more. Together we will get through this as one Cook County. 
Thank you. All right, so let me just say this right. Amanda Grazian and Walter Matthews. Thank you both, our sign language interpreters. Thank you, President Franklin. Well, we're gonna take some questions from viewers at home and then President will follow up with some questions press questions. Okay, the first one is from Bruce Montgomery from Technology Access Television. Please describe how Cook County is working to create digital equity by connecting more residents and businesses to affordable high-speed internet access. So first of all, let me just say, um, we worked with our partners in the sub south suburbs some time ago um, to put in basically conduit a long and expressway um, uh, to the south suburbs to ensure that we had access at our public institutions. So our um, uh, offices of local units of government, our universities and so on. So, and that was several years ago that we, um, we, we did this work and it was supported by the state of Illinois for which we're very grateful. And now CODE's charge is to try to help us figure out how we can um, better support better support those members of our community, and it's a quarter of the people in Cook County who do not have access to broadband. So we have to figure out how we're going to um, increase access and be sure that those who do have access also have um, computers. Uh, so it's not just that, that people don't have broadband access, they also don't have computers in their home with which to access the broadband. That is, that's available. So that's what CODE's charge is, to try to figure out how we can impact the quarter of the population in Cook County that does not have broadband access. This question is from Mike Maher, KWR Equity Strategies City Club member. Thank you. President Preckwinkle, thank you for your service and leadership through these most challenging times. Quick two-part question. How do your health and operations team envision being able to accurately and in real time track COVID-19? Who on your team is investigating real time tracking, tracing, monitoring pandemic decision support solutions to help the county get back in business? So we clearly have a, a challenge at all levels of government around contact tracing. I think uh, the Department of Public Health has 29 contact tracers. Dr. Joshi uh, is here with us from co-leader along with Dr. Rachel Rubin of the Cook County Department of Public Health. So clearly we're gonna have to staff up to meet the challenge of contact tracing. And as the pandemic wanes, it's both possible and necessary to do the contact tracing. At the peak of the epidemic, that's virtually impossible. But as the pandemic wanes, we need to invest in contact tracing to be sure that we um, stabilize uh, infection rates and don't see more peaks. Um, we're working with the state, we're working with the City of Chicago Department of Public Health, our own Cook County Department of Public Health uh, to staff up with contact tracers. Great. Another question, uh, Shannon Madden from C Crow LLP. What does Cook County government as an or organization need most from its constituents, the state or federal government for a successful long-term response to COVID-19? Well, first of all, you need to do certain things immediately, right? Uh, the hand washing, uh, masks, sheltering in place, following the governor's order to shelter in place. Um, we need to do individually all that we can to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Uh, but we're also gonna have to work together as we move through this crisis. And let me just say, uh, um, Dr. Rubin and, and Dr. Joshi have repeatedly said uh, that we're not going to be able to, to deal with the crisis uh, fully until we have a vaccine. And that's 18 months, two years away. Uh, so we have to understand that we're in the midst of the pandemic for the next year and a half, two years. And we have to think about our response in terms of being in the midst of the pandemic as we look toward uh, recovery. And as I said in my remarks, our recovery efforts have to be focused on equity because we know that the pandemic 
has had a disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, which were already struggling um, due to uh, due to racism, due to structural racism, due to lack of transportation access, to being food deserts. I mean, all of the challenges that communities of color have faced in this country for generations. Heidi Graham with the League of Women Voters asks, what is the county doing to prepare for the 2020 elections? There are no options for online voter registration trainings, and what about mail-in ballots? How we're gonna to respond to uh, the pandemic in, in, in light of the November election is still under discussion. I would say that we had higher levels of uh, mail-in ballots and early voting than we've ever had in the history of the state of Illinois in the March 17th primary. And so I think that there will be continued emphasis on um, those two methods of casting your ballots. It's unclear um, whether or not we'll move to a national uh, mail-in ballot uh, mode of operations as some have suggested. Renee Richardson with Wealth and Riches Today asks, what opportunities specifically are there for women and or minority owned businesses in the recovery process? Well, first of all, let me just say, um, we have a, a, a small business loan fund, loans of up to $20,000 for small businesses of 25 employees of less or less, five years, no interest. For gig workers who make less than $100,000 a year, it's a low interest, I'm sorry, zero interest, uh, five-year uh, loan for uh, up to ten thousand dollars, but these are available. This is available to people in the southern suburbs because we're using our federal dollars, which are allocated to the suburbs, uh, as a resource for this for this plan. So we do have, um, and and I, I would I would address uh, I would ask you to look at our CookCountyIL.gov forward slash recovery site for uh, technical assistance for small businesses across the county. Um, Janine Smith asks, are you proposing a three-tiered or five-tier approach to reopening? How do you plan to protect citizens on the public transportation? I know you discussed a little bit about the collaboration with our partners in um, suburban transit. Will you continue to do remote work and virtual meetings for some positions permanently? A multi-part question here. Let's see if I can remember all the parts. Uh, first of all, we're going to follow the governor's guidelines on reopening. My speech was about recovery, not reopening. That's on the governor's plate, and we're going to follow whatever the governor, we're going to follow the governor's directions, okay? All right, that's the first thing. What was the second and third? How do you focus on protecting citizens on public transit, and will you move some positions to permanent uh, remote jobs? Well, first of all, the public transit system is run by uh, PACE and CTA and Metra, and each of them have their own protocols for ensuring the safety of their riders. I can't frankly speak to them because I don't know what they are. Um, and, and the last thing is, I presume that we there will be um, more utilization of Zoom and Teams and conference calls uh, that we've relied on in the midst of this pandemic going forward. about um, the budget regarding the county um, specifically if federal funds are not able to be accepted in certain opportunities do you have any ideas at this point how you would um, close the budget gap or increase revenue during this uncertain time well first of all I ask Amara Ritzke our chief financial officer to come forward and help address this question but let me just say uh, the present estimates are $200 million or more uh, in lost revenue, and 65% of our revenues, if I remember correctly, from Amar's tutelage uh, are dependent on economic activity. That's sales taxes, amusement taxes, hotel and motel taxes. That presents a tremendous challenge, which is why um, I'm very hopeful that the federal government will respond in its next stimulus package and provide local units of government with, with access to federal resources for lost revenue. Amar? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, good morning, Amar Risky, County's Chief Financial Officer. So as Madam President stated, yes, the uh, number of our revenues are very economically sensitive. So it has impacted us uh, more disproportionately than it would 
uh, for those entities that are, uh, are non-economically sensitive uh, revenues. The expenses that we're seeing, uh, as you can imagine, are also naturally declining uh, somewhat because we are moving uh, away from uh, being in, in, uh, in our public spaces to working from home. So we've seen some utility costs and office supply costs and things like that uh, already decline. But beyond that, uh, the county, uh, just like in the past, have already taken measures to start looking at our expenses and trying to see how much we can manage through this. Uh, over the past few years, we've uh, taken advantage of the economic uh, growth and, and uh, bolster up some of our reserves in line with some of the, the best practices out there. And so that has also helped us, uh, you know, in this tough time for the specifically tough time to go through this. Those discussions are going forward and, and we hope to have a better uh, understanding by, by June when, when more uh, uh, up-to-date data comes through around economic activity. Thank you. Okay, Amanda. This is from Alice Yen. Um, how will the Council on Digital Equity open platform websites of lectures within the USC reach residents who don't have the internet access? Okay, so first of all, CODE is, is separate from the University of Chicago. CODE is our, our internal effort to look at the digital equity uh, uh, challenge, engage uh, our tech uh, partners in the effort to try to figure out how to address it. We're all, the, the, the separate initiative, so that's one. The separate initiative is with the University of Chicago, and it is a um, open platform, six weeks of, I think it's five days a week, is that right, Nick? Five days a week of lectures from University of Chicago professors and their guests. Um, I look forward to it, it sounds fascinating. It's gonna begin, I think, with COVID-19 related, uh, related uh, lectures, so uh, that should be interesting. So there are two different things. Code is our internal effort to try to address the fact that one quarter of our residents don't have access to the internet. And uh, the, the education platform with the University of Chicago is separate. And you're right, those who don't have access to the internet won't be able to access it. Uh, question, two part question from Miguel Wong, um, kind of on property taxes. Um, well, the annual tax sale of 2018 taxes, originally scheduled for early May, be rescheduled for this calendar year? If not, does the county have an alternative? And additionally, will the county open government officers, for example, offices, for example, the clerk, treasurer, assessor, on a limited basis to ensure essential functions can be carried out? Not everyone, again, has access to um, internet resources. So as I said earlier, we're going to follow the governor's guideline of, guidelines about sheltering in place. When the governor gives us a go ahead, we will be opening those offices. So that's the first thing. As to the tax sale, uh, that's something to be determined by the treasurer. I can't speak to it. Well, I think we're going to move on to questions um, from the press. We'll keep the live stream open. So if anyone would like to continue to watch um, on behalf of the City Club. <laughs> I'd like to thank um, everyone for tuning in today. Thank you for your support of the City Club. If you're not a member, please join. And you can also support the City Club through a tax-deductible donation. Special thanks to President Preckwinkle for sharing this information with us. And we look forward to eating a plate of pasta at Maggiano's from a safe distance, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Nick, help me out. Do we have questions from the press? Are we? Uh... Can we I'm sorry. Alice. Alice. Yeah, um, I have one more question. Um, are you doing some of the group for community access that would be part of the community advisory council? All right, just a second here. Um, the council is going to be convened by my chief of staff and staff by our director of policy and director of racial equity. Uh, we are in the process of recruiting members uh, from across the county um, in the hopes that we can uh, get started at the end of this month. Thank you. Alex? Yep. Yeah, okay. I have two quick questions for you, if that's okay. The first is if you could just give us an update on the Bureau of Economic Development Small Business Loan Fund you were talking about, and if you could tell us anything like 
how many businesses are contracted with supplied, how many have been um, given uh, loans, and, and you know the, the total volume of loans that have been awarded so far. Uh, first of all, we asked people to um, send us a, a, a letter of interest, basically, and I think we've gotten 7,000 of those. And we hope to um, begin our responses to those uh, initiatives at the beginning of June. So when, when would those loans start going out? As I said, we hope to be able to identify people who would be eligible for the loans at the beginning of June. Okay, um, my other question was related to the delay of the collection of some of the um, business taxes and, and fees that, as I understand it, is being delayed at this point until June 1st. Um, in light of some of the government's recent statements about how long the current phase is likely to go on, I just want to ask if, if there are discussions happening right now about um, extending that deadline further. I'll ask Amar Ritsky, our Chief Financial Officer, to respond. Thank you. Uh, Amar Ritsky, Cook County Chief Financial Officer. So uh, right now, we have extended the, uh, the due dates till June 1st. Uh, we are actively looking at the uh, response as well as our own uh, liquidity and cash flows to see how it, it works. Um, if there's a need, uh, which p potentially there is, we will definitely consider that, but we have to balance those uh, with our own financial realities. And so uh, those are discussions that are going on right now, but we hope to have uh, updates in the next coming weeks before the end of the month. Thank you. All right, are there others on the line? This is Rachel. Yes, Rachel. Um, can you maybe talk about how you see the county's response to the pandemic changing over the course of the three years, you know, as we wait for a vaccine? I'm going to ask Bill Barnes uh, of our Emergency Operations Center to, uh, to respond to that first. And then uh, Dr. Joshi um, from the Department of Public Health. Let me just say, um, Bill Barnes and his team uh, provide me with weekly briefings uh, at the Emergency Operations Center on, on our challenges regarding the pandemic. I'm deeply grateful to him and to Ted Berger, uh, who lead our team, our Emergency Management and Regional Security uh, Department. Um, and they've made it clear that uh, we're going to be challenged by this pandemic uh, for the next several years. Bill? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Bill Barnes, Executive Director, um, Emergency, Emergency Management and Regional Security. So to your question, how do we see the county's response um, changing as we sort of weather this storm? It's going to ebb and flow. Um, this is not a typical disaster where, say, a, a tornado strikes and response is going in, uh, rescuing people, Cleaning up, um, cleaning up debris, and then transitioning to a clean uh, recovery period where it's rebuilding and, and restoring services. Here, we anticipate um, several waves of um, infections, which are going to mean that uh, we are going to have to ramp up and down our recovery to respond to the, the situation on the ground. Uh, simultaneously, there are gonna be recovery actions because we can't wait to begin the recovery actions until this is over two years from now. So as Madam President said in her speech, we're already um, beginning to formulate those plans, but um, the recovery is going to have to, uh, right now we're in full bore uh, response mode, excuse me. We're in full bore response mode as we see the infections, the rates and the deaths and the hospitalizations begin to decrease and we enter a trough, we will have to ramp down or, or, or simmer um, our, our response efforts, knowing full well that we're gonna have to turn all those efforts on uh, as we enter the new phase, um, potentially in the fall. And with that, I'll, I'll, Dr. Joshi, if you wanna add a little more from the public health perspective. Dr. Kieran Joshi, Medical Officer, Cook County Department of Public Health. I would concur uh, with my colleagues' uh, comments and those of Madam President um, in that we do fully expect this pandemic to ebb and flow um, and for that waxing and waning to continue until there is a vaccine. Um, I think what you'll see 
is as cases uh, begin to ebb and, de and decrease, um, you'll see us step up our contact tracing efforts. And we are um, really planning for that um, quite a bit right now because we expect, um, I mean, according to some recommendations, a requirement for up to 30 contact tracers per 100,000 population, which if you do the math is hundreds of people. So this is gonna be a large effort and will involve quite a bit of coordination at all levels of government. Those conversations are ongoing. I'm confident that working together with our colleagues um, from neighboring counties uh, um, at the state and under the direction of the county board president that we will succeed in controlling the spread. Thank you. Nick, other questions? Alice, Alex, and Rachel, anybody have any further questions? This is Alex. I'll just I'll throw in one more, if it's okay, about that say I would just ask again about where the CCA is at this point. Do you have a sense of whether they're any closer to being willing to participate, or is it looking like just never? Uh, we hope for CTA's uh, participation. The moment we're in negotiations with Metra. Uh, around a fall implementation. We have a question, okay. we have a question from uh, Blue Vision. Uh, we are now counting with the second highest number of cases in the country, more than some of the harder hit counties uh, in New York. And it looks like we'll be down to that soon. Why? I would ask Dr. Joshi to respond. Hi, Kieran Joshi, Medical Officer, Cook County Department of Public Health. Um, there was some discussion about this uh, due to a news story in the New York Times earlier this week. Um, and I believe what, we've, what we're seeing is that in New York, um, you had an epidemic playing out under certain circumstances. And here you're seeing the epidemic playing out under different circumstances. Um, so in New York, there was a, a really quick surge and then a long, slow decline. Um, here in Chicago, uh, Cook County, and the state of Illinois, um, our pump was primed a little bit because we had some cases early on in January. And subsequently, I think you saw our leaders take really decisive action, which led to a flattening of the curve. So we've, as a result, had um, a slow, steady stream of cases. Thank you. Oh, one more thing I would say, we also have I, th I believe the second highest uh, number of tests in the country. And as you can imagine, the number of cases we have is a function of the number of tests. So thanks. Thank you all.